Before seminary, for probably a decade or more, I was very involved in Toastmasters, which you may know is the club for people petrified to get up in front of people and talk. Now, that wasn't me, obviously. I had been in theater, obviously. <laughs> but I really wanted help in extemporaneous speaking, getting better able to speak off the cuff when what I was saying wasn't memorized or written down in front of me. This proved to be useful later, a few years later, when I discovered that hosts at dinner parties and facilitators of large Zoom meetings would suddenly call on me to pray. <laughs> but it's useful in other ways, too. People who need practice with English as a second language find it very helpful. People in the corporate world hone their presentation skills and their interviewing skills. So I do recommend it. But the real reason I'm bringing it up right now is that the whole thing works by peer evaluation. The members evaluate one another's speeches. They evaluate the meeting. They evaluate the evaluations. If you don't think about how well you're doing something and hear others' opinions, how are you going to get any better? In the poem, Let America Be America Again, written in 1935 by Langston Hughes, he describes the American dream that never existed for the impoverished and the immigrants' hope for freedom and equality that was never realized. In the work, the poet represents not only African Americans, but also the economically disadvantaged and other minority groups. He evaluates his country in order to hold her up to her ideals. These are some of the first few stanzas. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It was never America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. It continues on from there. I noticed a recent social media post where a responder dismissed criticism of our country as yet another instance of the left denigrating the United States. He apparently wasn't a Toastmaster because he didn't seem to realize that to improve something, you have to evaluate it. Or perhaps he felt it was working just fine before people like him began enjoying some, people who aren't like him began enjoying some of the rights he enjoys, like voting and being able to marry. I really don't know his mind. Let me pause to acknowledge that Let America Be America Again may sound similar to the more recent slogan, Make America Great Again. But the second harkens back to an undefined greatness rather than hoping that the country will live up to its initial promise. And that undefined greatness apparently includes hoping that advances towards freedom, equality, and bodily autonomy for everyone be dismantled. At least there's recent evidence for that theory. Two decades after Langston Hughes wrote, Let America Be America Again, the writer and activist James Baldwin wrote in his collection of essays, Notes of a Native Son, I love America more than any other country in the world. And for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. In our efforts this morning to reimagine democracy, 
we very well might look back on what it looked like in our country in the past and evaluate not only how we might improve it, but wonder, did it live up to its promise even in its infancy? Langston Hughes would argue that it didn't. UU minister Reverend Peggy Clark wrote an essay titled Equality in a Sea of Inequality, which can be found on the UUA worship web. Referring to the Founding Fathers, she wrote, Those men weren't distracted by the genocide they inspired or the enslavement of other people they required for this, nature, for this nation to be born. They declared equality while swimming in a sea of inequality. When they declared all men are, were created equal, they meant white Protestant men. They didn't mean women. They weren't including black people who'd been enslaved or those who were free. They didn't include Catholics or Jews or people who didn't own land. They were so proud of their inclusivity, so inspired by their own cutting edge philosophy that they had no idea how narrow it was, how constrictive, how small a vision. Just as politicians nearly 250 years ago talked of equality and democracy while imagining it only for themselves, politicians today use voter suppression and gerrymandering to make the votes of, most, of those most like themselves count most, if at all. The Electoral College was created by the former and continues to be used by the latter to thwart one person, one vote. It seems to me that if you don't want people you disagree with voting, you're really not that much for actual democracy. Because it's not easy to take into account those whose worldview and values differ, differ greatly from mine. I'm reminded of that on social media every day. And harder still to acknowledge their vote should count as much as mine. But it's a bit like the Toastmaster meeting. I have to not only believe my opinion about their speech has value, I have to acknowledge their evaluation of my speech may have some value. The premise here is, if I want my voice heard, I should acknowledge that theirs should be heard as well. But it shouldn't count any more than mine. So I need to be sure to cast my vote. Because those whose values and priorities differ from mine, are rallying those who agree with them to vote. I need to encourage those who, whose values match mine to be sure to cast their votes as well. A UU group on social media recently posted a photo of the plaque that marks the location of the Long Lane Meeting House, where the Massachusetts State Convention voted to ratify the United States Convention. Uh, I'm sorry, the United States Constitution, and where, 37 years later, the American Unitarian Association was organized in 1825. It's not a coincidence that democracy was an important concept to the founding fathers of both the country and Unitarianism as they emerged about the same time in New England. The right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society, I'm sorry, I skipped. Democracy's importance is reflected in our fifth principle. There you go. The right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Why it's important is reflected in essentially all the other principles. We believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, as it says in the first, so why wouldn't we work to be sure every voice is heard? The interdependent web referenced in the seventh suggests to us that none of us are free until we are all free. You can find the words liberty, justice, and equity sprinkled liberally throughout the principles. UUA President Susan Frederick Gray wrote, Unitarian Universalist commitment to justice, equity, and democracy is not just political or moral. It is fundamentally theological. 
it reflects the fact that our theology is not so much concerned with the afterlife, but is accountable to human experience and the conditions of people's lives here and now. Human dignity and interdependence are the foundation of our commitment to a multiracial, pluralistic democracy. So, if we agree that democracy is not only a good thing, but a thing to help ensure, where the supreme power is vested in the people, not unelected royalty, how do we effectively work to establish and safeguard that? First, I would suggest we need to encourage everyone we know to both register and vote, and to help them do so if necessary. And that, of course, includes ourselves. Then we need to encourage everyone that we don't know to vote. Unregistered voters are just people we haven't met yet. As I said before, democracy is a UU tradition and passion. It's part of who we are morally, ethically, and theologically. You can go to uuthevote.org to see what we're doing on a national level. Not now. Put away your phones. As we heard last week, the Texas UU Justice Ministry is helping congregations around the state engage in voter registration, fight for election reform, in protecting voting rights and democracy, and organizing get out the vote drives. Locally, we've even hired a voting justice organizer to help all the UU congregations around Houston get out the vote. Come to Channing Hall after the service and meet Jordan and get involved. He, he's waving his hand. There you go. I can hear what some of you are saying. I don't like politics. It's unseemly, icky. They're all crooks and it won't do any good anyway. And I've got shows to stream. I know people say this because I had a friend say it to me the other day. After declaring that one politician is just as bad as the other, he waited for a reaction from me. I paused. When prompted for a response, I said, no, I think that gives people a free pass to not research candidates and find out which ones are actually better. When that happens, it seems to me, those who do even bother to vote just use a visceral reaction to TV commercials or Facebook posts to vote. What I later realized I could have added, after thinking about it, is I believe this is at least partially responsible for how we got in this current mess. People believe all politicians are lying cheats, so they vote for a celebrity businessman because he isn't a politician. Because a businessman would never be as deceitful as a politician, right? Because a businessman has to be more competent than a politician, right? So we end up here. We saw someone who didn't understand the need for a U.S. pandemic response team fire the team immediately before a global pandemic, then politicize both the pandemic and the vaccine. We saw someone who couldn't accept the results of an election create mayhem, then weaponize his inacceptance with untruths and those who retold them. The current makeup of the Supreme Court is a result of presidents being appointed via the Electoral College who did not win the majority vote. Because of that, we now see the, the dismantling of laws that most Americans approve of. We work with a metropolitan organization that works to develop power and leadership among citizens. They teach folks how to create relational power to shape public policy. They teach people who think no one cares or will listen to their voice how to have their voice heard. At a training for volunteers, Elizabeth, the lead organizer, asked people what they thought about politics. They gave a lot of answers similar to what my friend might have said about the tawdry and crooked nature of politics and those who choose to do it for a living. They may have heard what Robin Williams once said. The word politics comes from poly, a Latin word meaning many, and ticks meaning blood-sucking creatures. 
Elizabeth was quick to point out to them that politics is how and where things get decided, and we cannot relinquish our ability to influence those decisions. Because I, I, I will guarantee you there are plenty of f folks who don't hold our values working to influence those decisions. A quote attributed to Governor Ann Richards states, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're likely on the menu. Surely Chisholm expanded this idea. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. TMO holds what they call accountability sessions. Candidates for political office are invited to meet and answer questions. Those wanting face time with voters often agree to attend. They are often impressed with how many engaged voters are, are there, voters who have actually done their research, and it gives them pause to realize these people actually plan to hold them accountable in exchange for their vote. This is how you learn not all politicians are alike, and you find out which ones are competent and which ones hold some or all of your values. And yes, it takes more effort than simply saying, they're all crooks. By encouraging more people to vote and by holding elected officials accountable, we can reimagine democracy to be what the promise of a more enlightened, inclusive America originally could have been. Even just a few years after its founding, there were those who realized American democracy wasn't what it was purported to be, let alone ideal. Henry David Thoreau wrote, is a democracy such as we know it the last improvement possible in government? Is it not possible to take a step further towards recognizing and organizing the rights of people? Langston Hughes' poem ends with these lines. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me ugly, any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Amen. <laughs>